Well, now is the time for the Joan Kerner Social Justice Oration. It's become an important fixture of this conference and for good reason. Firstly, let's talk about Joan. Our former Premier, our, fir our first female Premier, the lady I worked for 25 years ago, and I have to confess I fell in love with for her intellect, passion, and her unending passion for social justice. She is a campaigner for women, for education, for the environment, and for equality. A woman who always remembers your name, even if she's met you only once, it's bizarre how she does it, and holds you to your promises, and then adds a few more promises to your list, and has a style that has you simply saying, impossible to say no. Unfortunately, I received work last night that Joan was not going to make it to the conference today. She is actually very, very seriously ill. Communities in Control has always been among her annual highlights, so she wanted to wait till the last minute to say she couldn't make it. So she's in hospital and her thoughts are with us. I can assure you that she's here in spirit. In fact, I've been instructed, in fact ordered, as Joan does, to personally deliver the recording of this session tonight at the hospital. So let's all show her how much we wish she was here. Thank you. When Joan presented this oration herself back in 2012, she finished by urging us all to get angry. Get angry and get organised, she said. That's good advice still. She gave us all some homework. I think it's worth repeating two of those points today. Two of the things that she said our homework were. One, to restate and recommit to your values. And secondly, to plan your individual and collective campaign to strengthen social justice in Australia. I want to reissue those challenges on Joan's behalf today. All of the things we've heard over the past two days demonstrate it's never been more important to get angry and get organised. There's so much to do and we can't do it alone. Someone who knows a whole lot about getting organised, although I can't picture him ever getting angry, he's as cool as a, cu a cucumber, but amazingly more charming. He is the 2015 Joan Kerner Social Justice Orator, Dan Morrie. Or, to use his complete title, Retired Lieutenant Colonel in the US Marine Corps, Dan Morrie. Dan may be more well known to many of you as Major Michael Morrie, the American Marine who defended David Hicks when his own government, our government, had thrown him to the wolves. Though he wasn't outwardly angry, Dan was always relentless and brave. He refused to be cowed. He spoke truth to power in every sense of the word. He won a lot of friends in Australia and across the world. And now he's living here and working as a social justice consultant with Shine Lawyers here in Melbourne. Dan also set up and helps to run the little known, but it will become more well known, an incredibly important NGO, Australians Detained Abroad. Let's hope that none of us ever have to use that service, though I know it could all use our support. It turns first birthday, I think, on Thursday. I'm incredibly honoured on behalf of Joan to share a stage with jo Dan and I know that Joan is also very honoured to have him deliver this 2015 oration. Joan read his book, or she ordered me to get the book, um, and she read it in two days and when she was very sick she rang me and said, finished it, great choice, amazing book, and then said, he's one of us. I think there's no greater compliment than to have that from Joan. Please welcome Dan Morrie.
Thank you, Dennis, for that nice uh, introduction. Um, no pressure, thanks. Um, oh, look, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and be part of um, this wonderful event. And um, I've got some slides, and hopefully they'll come up. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about and sort of propose, are you prepared to disobey? Yes. Are you prepared really to disobey? Yes. Now, are you? Yes. Is anybody awake? <laughs> are you prepared to disobey? Yes. All right. Now, what I'm talking about there is I'm not just talking about, you know, going out there and uh, breaking the law, right? Um, and, of course, this, you, this, you know, are you prepared to disobey? One asterisk is it doesn't apply to my children. Um, no, nah, just kidding. But it's really about are, are you prepared to do the right, what's right and to do the right thing? And how do we do that? Um, and sometimes when we do the right thing, we might have to be disobeying, right? We might disobey a law. We might disobey what is politically expected, what is popular, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and, and hit on a little bit of what Jones asked us to refocus on. Um, but I do obviously uh, want to sh start with a little bit about who I am and, and the only reason I, poor Maureen, during the, right after or before lunch, she dragged me in a room with these, with these uh, high school students. Are they still here? All right, yes. <sighs> pressure, that was pressure, right? Um, y you know, and, uh, whoops. And they said, uh, they said uh, I told them, I said, look, I ended up going to the Marines because I flunked out of you know, college. And Marines said, that's not true. You could never have flunked out of college. No, I did. Um, you know, I, I went to finish uni, I mean, finish high school. And in the U.S., we don't have a gap year. And I think I probably could have used that. Instead, I went to college and uh, university and partied a little bit, played some American football and probably didn't study as hard. So I came home on uh, my Christmas break and joined the uh, United States Marine Corps in December of uh, 1983. Um, at the age of five, um, and, uh, and, and sort of, I needed my extremist organization to help step me straight, and I did, and I, I did four years, and I loved it, and uh, I think that gave me the opportunity to grow up and mature as a, as a person, and as a responsible adult, and I then went to uh, um, law school. Uh, luckily, I had the opportunity after finishing university, again, my life doesn't seem to be too well planned out, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back in the Marine Corps, because one of the reasons is I was worried was you don't know what your job is until you've signed up and you've actually gone to about four months of training, and then everybody, depending on your seniority and how well you're doing at the school, you go, pick, you go in a room and pick your job. So you don't know what it is. I could be a, you know, a motor transport officer, an, a, a, an admin officer, which I did not want to be. And so I told my Marine recruiter, I'm going to take the Navy flight test, because they would let you be a backseater in, in, in the Navy aircraft without 2020 vision, where the Marine Corps, you couldn't. Um, and he said, well, geez, you know, what's the problem? I told him I don't want to be an admin officer. He said, well, do you want to be a lawyer? I said, sure, what do I got to do? And he said, well, see if you get into law school. And that's how I, that was the inspiration for me to becoming a lawyer. Little did I know uh, what kind of career I might have. But life is like that. Life presents opportunities sometimes, and you just got to be willing to take it. Um, and, and I think with, that was, you know, one that uh, set me down a path um, of my life. And obviously, the next one um, sort of uh, was when my boss, I was in Hawaii in uh, 2003, and my boss came in and said, hey, I got an email. They're looking for these people who work at a commission. Do you want me to put your name in? And I said, uh, okay. You know, little did I know, again, how that was going to change my life. And probably without either of those two things happening, I wouldn't be here today. Um, I put this picture in solely to show how young I was. <laughs> no other purpose, self, self gratification. Yeah, but whenever, you know, obviously the, the, the Hicks Commission, the military commissions, being stuck in something that was so very um, different, something I was not prepared for, and something that I think in, in needed certain values and needed definitely getting organized. And I certainly had to rely on so many people to assist. And I think that was what really allowed us to persevere, was so many people within Australia and the United States to assist, whether it was from academics, the politicians, um, other NGOs. Um, you know, GetUp was great. Amnesty was great. Um, there were so many different groups in the legal professions as well that came together and, and worked together to reach this common goal of trying to provide justice to an Australian citizen. And you know, and when you have these challenges in life, you have got, you know, sometimes you have people against you, working against you, right? They're not always the most friendly and they're not always the most um, easy to overcome, but they're out there. But my, my, I also want to say the last thing, my little social justice, where my persona came from, really didn't start, you know, it predated the commissions. Most people think I, you know, 
I, I, I'm a lefty because of the commissions now. No, I thought my, my thought everyone deserved a fair trial regardless, and I thought that was pretty mainstream. Um, my first experience dealing with um, and advocating for people that needed help, which is something that you all do, um, was in Massachusetts. At this time, it's the Munson Developmental Center. That's where I, where I worked as my first uh, in law school. I had the opportunity through my law school to work with the Disability Law Clinic and represent individuals who had been um, basically incarcerated, not incarcerated, but put in this facility, um, whether against or, or with their will, um, that had been there for 30, 40 years. It originally had been an epilepsy center, and unfortunately, in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, and 40s even, there were people still there, that all they were is young children with epilepsy, and they got sent off to be institutionalized. And so it gave me a, a, a taste of not only of the work for those that were trying to assist the, the, the challenges for the legal representatives trying to help these families, because there was none. There was no, no, no NGO out there helping these residents. Um, the staff that really wanted to help as well, but the, the pull between resources and staffing is always a challenge. And to try to advocate for people to just have the ability to walk down the street and leave the grounds to go to the Burger King. Can you go? Can, can we let them go? You know, Bob would like to walk to Burger King and be able to go there to get food. No, he can't go. Why, why not? Because he might fall. You know, do we, Bob, Bob broke his glasses. Why haven't you bought him a new pair of glasses? Well, he'll, make, he'll just break them again. This attitude, and it, and it comes from being protective, but they couldn't understand the dignity and risk for these residents and those that wanted to try to leave um, and the challenge of helping these people not only against potentially the bureaucracy that was worried about them getting injured more than the quality of life for these people or the family members that didn't want them spending the money that had been accumulating over 20, 30 years. You can imagine, there were some large accounts. Why do we need to buy Bob another pair of glasses? He's just gonna break them. And so that really opened my eyes to the need for people to be out there in the community advocating. And I was very, I think that affected me greatly. And um, it was something I'm very happy that I got the experience to do in my life. Martin Luther King says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And since you're all here, you're not becoming silent. You are all participating out there, really on the front lines, fighting the good fight. And I hope you all know the quality and, and how much appreciation there should be for the work that you do. You may not hear it every day, right? You may not get a pat on the back every day. Um, but it's so important to have organizations that are outside in the communities advocating, providing services, for those that may not be able to do it for themselves. I know in, in, in these, you know, not-for-profit and organizations, is sometimes you can feel like there's a large bureaucracy, right? Here's, here's the Obamacare flow chart. Um, and that's not a knock on Obamacare, I'm just, you know, it was a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a representation and it's also an eye test. If you can read it, you've got great eyesight. But, you know, in this whole, the whole concept, this, this, this this conference was to think differently. You know, your job is to try to think differently. Your job is to look at this or look at a challenge and see the way around. And it might not be the expected way. And you're the ones who are going to come up with the great ideas. Um, you know, you're going to be asked to do more with less, right? The slowing of charitable donations, budget cuts, uncertain regulations are all the challenges that face you but you're gonna to have to do more with less. And because you don't wanna remain silent, I know you can do it. Some of, you're gonna to have to think about collaborative engagement. How are you going to maximize, have a force multiplier for you and your organizations? You know, how are you gonna provide more services? How are you gonna get those resources from collaborative engagement, um, information, partnerships? You need to be figuring out who you could partner with to maximize and multiply your forces universities. Merging. Have you ever heard about the, the uh, Save the Children Good Beginnings merger? Yes? Huge. Do you think it's a good thing? Yeah, no. But, but merging, I'm not saying it, it, you know, it's a competition between how many people you employed and providing services. There is a balance. But as money and resources shrink, how are you going to adapt and overcome? And technology, obviously, is something that you're, um, you're utilizing and is out there. I want to um, 
follow a little bit on what Joan said and what Joan asked us to recommit to our values. And I want to talk to you a little about moral courage and just discuss some areas where people have, have had to have that moral courage. I'm using the Marine Corps leadership trait definition of courage. Moral courage means having the inner strength to stand up for what is right and to accept blame when something's your fault. It's a pretty good definition. Do you agree? Yeah. I want to give you some examples. And now, how many of you were born in the, or were alive in the 60s? Not many, right? <laughs> Who remembers the My Lai Massacre? And many of you, and it was a tragic experience for the United States forces, killing hundreds of innocent people. But there was one helicopter crew that when they observed what was happening, Chief Warren Officer Thompson lowered his helicopter and placed it in between U.S. forces and civilians. And ordered his door gunner, as he got out, that if the Americans did not stop shooting, he was to shoot and engage the American forces. That took the moral courage. Not many people know about his story, and I wish more people did. Because what an, a situation to stand up against his own forces. And this was something I was taught uh, in the Marine Corps which I was very happy about the Marine Corps, the one thing from my Marine Corps experience, dealing and trying to reinforce you to do what is right. May, we're not all perfect and we may not all achieve it, but it was at least discussing, and discussing situations like this, putting you and thinking about how you would deal with it in your situation. Have anybody seen the movie Diplomat yet? No, no one's seen it. It's about the last Nazi general of Paris who was ordered by Hitler to destroy Paris and burn it to the ground. And one of the diplomats who tried to encourage him not to, and his decision ultimately to disobey Hitler and not destroy Paris. And these are some more of the maybe widely known internationally decisions. And I, I like to talk a little bit about Matt Diaz. Does anybody know Lieutenant Commander Matt Diaz? No, I, I didn't expect you would. Because those that show certain moral courage or dis, are willing to disobey don't always well known. But Matt Diaz, I first met him when I was a lawyer and at Diego Garcia. I was out there defending a case, and he was the staff judge advocate, basically the command lawyer. And then I met him again at Guantanamo on one of my trips down to Gitmo. And there he was, and he'd been assigned as part of the legal staff at, at Guantanamo. And at the time, this is when all the legal challenges were trying to be mounted in the U.S. federal court to challenge the detention. The only people who could get legal challenges mounted were those that their relatives actually knew they were there. And that was a small handful. The majority, their names had not been released publicly. Their families did not know that they were necessarily there. They might have suspected. Matt Diaz, right or wrong, he felt that people should know who's there. And one day he printed off a list of names and he sent it off to an NGO in New York. That lost him his 19-year career um, and went to prison for six months. But he felt that's what was right, that these people should be able to have access. And it was almost the day after his sentencing that the U.S. Department of Defense released all the names anyway. But here he was sitting there. I, I've, I've, I knew him, and, I, and, it, and it struck me that here was a guy sitting in a lonely office one night doing what he did because he felt it was right, whether or not it was legal is a different question, but he morally felt this was right, and he really sacrificed a lot. I don't think, uh, you know, th there's examples of Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning, um, that we recognize, of people, whistleblowers, that are willing to disobey at cost for themselves. And Edward Snowden. I want to touch on a little unknown, probably, does anybody know CVS Pharmacy from the States here? Yeah? Where's our American? There's one American here. Where's my American? CVS Pharmacy. Uh, your chemists don't sell tobacco, right? It seems shocking, right? What do you think our pharmacists in the U.S. sell? Well, guns. <laughs> I love it. All right, they're guns. They sell tobacco. So CVS Pharmacy, one of the largest chains. There's CVS and Walgreens. Um, and they sell, look at how cheap our tobacco sales is compared to yours. That's $10 for a pack. Is there any smokers here? A few? Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm off. I'm trying to get off chewing tobacco. I've, uh, the the Nicorette gum doesn't work too well. But, um, but CVS, my point is CVS had 7,700 retail outlets. Tobacco sales brought in $2 billion revenue a year. 
And in October 2014, they said, no, no more selling cigarettes. And remember the earlier speaker talking about corporate. And I think that there is well no compassion or corporate responsibility. I think CVS has set a great example in the corporate world. They said no. The uh, CEO said, you know, we've got 26,000 pharmacists and nurse practitioners who are helping millions of patients each and every day. They manage conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, all conditions that are worsened by smoking. We've come to the decision that cigarettes have no place in an environment where healthcare is being delivered. $2 billion. Now, a cynic might say they're really making room for medicinal marijuana. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, to really think about it for a business to do this. You know, and of course they were attacked and told, you know, this is what I, the commentators, right? This is not a market, uh, this is not a market that's saying, you know what, I'm going to buy CVS stock because they're good citizens, Kramer said during an appearance. It just doesn't work like that. This is a, th that's a nice world, like Oz. Oz is terrific. I think he meant, you know, the world, world Wizard of Oz, not Austria. Um, Kramer, again, I'm stuck with four walls of trying to figure out the earnings per share. The earnings per share for CVS just got worse. Right, so this is the mindset. The mindset is, this is business, it's different. You don't get to have, have a social conscience because it's about capitalism. It's about greed. I don't want to just go against what you said earlier, but right, there's a lot of greed in the world. And CVS took a stand. I really do think it's something that's, that, that, was, that, that took a lot for them to be willing to do this. And actually, luckily, their share price went up, so I'm so glad that the pundits were wrong. Oh, what? Sorry, I thought she was asking a question. Um, Gandhi Salt March, 1930. Who knows about that? Right? The, what was one of the mainstay ingredients for, for the Indians' food? Salt. And who did they have to buy it from? Could they buy it from anyone else? No. And so Gandhi had his march to, to protest and to go make sugar, I mean, salt himself. And again, this is a good action, a good example of a con, you know, consumer action and disruption. And it came with cost. Over 60,000 people were arrested. In the U.S., in, in, in here in Australia, did you have the, you know, in the U.S., we had the whole huge draft dodger. Yeah? And does everybody know about Muhammad Ali? Yeah. I mean, think about it. For Muhammad Ali at the time, he was the world heavyweight champion. He was getting drafted, and he needed to make that decision. Am I going to disobey and risk jail time and a fine for his principles and his values? And he did. And give up his title, his, his, whole, his, whole, you know, his whole career. And he was sentenced to five years. Didn't have to serve at all, thankfully. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention about Martin Luther King, right? In the march to Selma. Examples of people that stood up for what they believed right, even when it expensed to themselves. The challenge is sometimes figure out what is right. We don't always know. It's not the same for everybody. We have our families and our friends, and that's maybe what's teaching us what's right. Sometimes it, we have, we're in professions that have guidelines. Sometimes it's just your gut. And in preparation, I think there's some preparation to thinking about and doing what's right. You know, have you thought about situations that might come up which could create ethical dilemmas for you? In your, whether in the workplace, at home, in life. Have you thought about it? And how would you handle it? Because integrity is, is at the heart of courage. You know, it's not a light switch, right? And doing what's right is not a light switch that you can just turn, flip on and off when you need to. It's who, part of who you are. And what may be right may differ between people, and that's okay. Um, and we're not all perfect, and it's not all easy. And if my wife was here, she'd be selling, confirming I'm not perfect. But if we try and we practice by our values, and there's many different values that apply to all of you in your different roles, I'm picking one, but you, you know what those are that apply to your specific organizations. Um, and if we live by them and we try to stay true to them, it's going to make our lives and those we serve much um, better off. You know, what are the fears? What are the fears that we get, you, you, you know, that make us have those ethical dilemmas or might not act in the appropriate way, right? Fear of failure. Who's, who's afraid of failing? I am. I'm, I'm up here sweating. <laughs> right? Woo. Did someone try? Other people are fanning, so it's not just me. All right? It's hot. Uh, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't want to do a bad job. We don't want to fail our, our, the people we provide services to, our organizations. 
or desire for success, competitiveness, which I think is different than failure. Do you agree with that? You can be fair to failure, then there's others that are competitive. Could fear of not being accepted, you know, the other, not a fear, but look, I don't need to do this or I don't have to be ethical about this because no one's going to know. And I think also to whom we owe a duty sometimes. That conflicting, am I making this decision and is it best for the person I'm supposed to provide services to or to the organization, right? In my experience, it was at one time, it was sort of with Guantanamo, it was this conflict between client versus the cause. What might be good for your client is, doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the cause and can, can those can compete. I, I put this slide up here only because I like another example about the Marines, but here's General Mattis. Here was his motto, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. <laughs> so there was some lawyer, luckily it wasn't me, whose job was in to go tell him no times, you know? Um, and sometimes, look, we're in the professions that have to make the hard call sometimes, you know? You, you know, you need, saying no is sometimes the best course of action, you know? And, and you know, uh, you get what you inspect, right? I, I use this term for the Marine Corps, you get what you inspect. If you're not inspecting, if you're not looking, or if you're ignoring, you're gonna end up with problems. You need to seek advice because you're making these tough things. You've got to have time to reflect. And I think the other adage, again, from the military is fixing problems now is far easier than fixing them later. And sometimes your role can be, yes, you might have to say no, but you're really trying to figure out how to get to yes, if that makes sense. Look, our character and our reputation, it takes years to build and moments to destroy. True? True. You know, the other issue thing and I want to talk about here is, how is this valued in our society? How is character valued in our society? Is character valued at all? Not enough. I mean, how does it value character? Is there, a, is there an Emmy Award for character? Is there a, uh, is there, no? Is there a $5 million contract for character? No. Does the contractor come and put a free addition on your house if you've got good character? No. Right? It's hard to measure, and it's hard to value. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a challenge for people. But I do think it's something that we need to think about and talk about more, and how people value character um, in people. Does anybody know who this is? 50 bucks if you get it right. That's, that's Australian dollars. No, not Lance Armstrong. He's wearing the postal shirt, but it's not Lance Armstrong. Any, anybody? No, it's Scott Mercer. You, no one knows who Scott Mercer is either. Do you know why you don't know who Scott Mercer is? He wouldn't take drugs. He said no to taking drugs. And you don't know who he is, but we do know who he is. There's something wrong in our society. There's something wrong that we don't know Scott, but we know this guy. And that we know her. Um, and I offer you this, there's now a blocker you can install on your web page that will block anything to do with the Kardashians. So it's card card blocker. So look it up and you can use it. Um, but this is really, you know, we, we were talking about values and community and the, inter, you know, and the communications are, I really think, you know, this is part of it. This is part of the devaluing of community because now people are more worried about what she's doing than what's going on locally. Um, I want to leave you with a few last things. I want to leave you with one more because I was supposed to keep this to 20 minutes and I've already gone over. Um, I want to leave you with this definition of courage by General Kurlak, the 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps. Courage acted out in our lives, watches out for the oppressed, speaks up for the weak, takes a stand against injustice and immorality, and does so at our own expense. But the courage to take a stand against what is popular and easy when required is the key to experiencing a clear and uncluttered conscience. And I think his definition hit it. This came out in 1997. So people say to me, Dan, why, you know, you stood up. Why did, where did that come from? It came from people like General Krulak teaching us this years before. Teaching me that, that statement right there is what's supposed to be being a Marine is about. 
May not all of us live up to it at the time, but that is really the epitome. I want to say, I want to finish up with one, one thing too, because I want, to, I want to give you permission. Hugh, is Hugh still here? I want to give you permission to be selfish. I want to give you, and I want to tell you you need to be. And I put this slide up here. Does anybody know why? Why? That's right. Because you need to put your mask on first. Because if you don't, you put it on your child, you'll die and you'll probably screw up putting it on your child. You need to take care of yourself. You're all in a profession. You all care about others and you want to help others. Does anybody want to help someone else? Is that why you do what you do? Yes. You can only do that if you're ready. And that means take care of your mind, your body, your family. Right? So you, can, you need to be sometimes a little bit, I don't, you know, right, selfish. You need to take time for yourself or else you won't be in a position to help others. So I, give you, I want you to focus that. And that's not just for you, but it's other people within your organization. Are they taking care of themselves? Are you giving them the opportunity to do that, to make sure that their mind and body is in a position so they can keep up the fight 100%? I'm also going to show you um, the secret to the meaning of life. So there it is. Um, I want to say this, and, and again, this was just talking to the high school students, you know, put me under a lot of pressure. But I think I would say this, I'd offer this to you. If you're doing, if what you're doing is what you like, and if you're doing with people that you like to be around, you've got it. You've got it, right? I mean, and that is so important. I'm not sure which is more important, doing something with the people you like being around or, or doing what you enjoy, but with people that you may not like so much. Might even be being with people you like. I, you know, I've had bad jobs, or not bad jobs, but you, people would probably view them as menial. I cooked a grill, cooking hamburgers up in a, a ski, but it was a ski resort for three weeks with my, my friends from college. I had the best time of my life. And so I think it's important that you really take Pause and think about where you're at, and hopefully you're doing something with the people you like, and you're doing something you like, and you get those two goals. If you get those two right, I think you're going to find out that life is good. And I also think the other sort of philosophy I have is, you know, life is a journey, not a destination. Right? It's about the journey. It's not, you're not, we're not all, we're all going to get to death, right? It's the stuff in the middle that matters. And so relish in it and do, you know, live with those that you, you, uh, you, you, uh, you want to be around and, and, and do what you do. I, I'm going to finish here. I'm going to, I'm a little bit off of what Hugh said. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read you this from John Lennon because I think happiness is important. When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment, and I told them they didn't understand life. I'd like to take full credit for the quote, but I, I can't, right? And I think it's so true. I think it's so true. And um, that, that you find out what makes you happy, doing what and being with who makes you happy, and that's so important because if you're happy, you're going to have the energy to help so many of those people out there relying upon you. And, and I think you all deserve a, an applause for the work that you do, all right? You do. And I'd like to finish off, before we get to questions, just one. Can we all say hi to Joan? One, two, three. Hi, Joan! <laughs> <laughs>